Hey, my friend, welcome back to the MindShift Podcast. Really excited to have you here today for another amazing interview episode with uh, a friend of mine, uh, Nathan Whitaker. He is a serial entrepreneur who started his first business when he was 11 years old. He thrives in finding innovative ways to create value in his own business, help his clients pursue their business goals, and grow his team uh, to be leaders in their industry. He's a published author and has over 30 years of experience in technology and entrepreneurship. He brings passion in helping people get better uh, in their lives through technology, cybersecurity, intentional culture, and he is the president and CEO of Stimulus Technologies. He authored the book, The CEO's Digital Survival Guide, which is your indispensable compass to successfully charting the path towards a prosperous future. We've got a lot to talk about, but for right now, let's welcome Nathan to MindShift. How are you doing, sir? Oh, good. Thank you, Daryl. Appreciate the introduction. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. So where are you, at? Where are you joining us from? So I'm based in Las Vegas, Nevada, or just outside of the city of Las Vegas, and I uh, lived here most of my life, so still love it here in the desert. Nice, nice, nice. That's how we met. That's how we met. So we've known each other for... It's in the neighborhood of 15 years, if not a little bit more than that. I think that's right. Yeah, good to still call you a friend. Ain't that something? Mm. <laughs> um, Nathan, I want to start with your uh, entrepreneurial journey, obviously. Um, 11 years old, what on earth were you doing at 11? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's in uh, my blood. Uh, both my parents were business owners and, you know, just all, you know, all four of us kids, um, have owned businesses at some point. Um, and, you know, my parents taught us to work hard and, you know, be independent. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just ingrained in all four of us kids. So when I was 11 years old, uh, I had a neighbor that actually had a little candy store and they decided to move. And I went to my parents and said, Hey, you know, can we, can I do the same thing? It seemed like they always had kids coming and going with, uh, with candy out of their house and buying candy. And, and so my mom took me down to smart and final and we bought, uh, it helped me buy my first inventory of, of candy bars and like Snickers and Milky Way or whatever it may be. And, and she said, but if you're going to do this, we're going to run it like a real business. And so she, she, uh, bought some ledger paper and I had to keep track of inventory and taught me how to, you know, mark out how much I bought it for, how much I should sell it for, you know, track inventory every day to make sure I didn't have, you know, theft and learned a lot about business. And at one point I was selling almost $200 worth of candy out of my house a week, um, which was a lot of money for an 11 year old kid. <laughs> You're a millionaire. And, and uh, I was uh, a deviant. No taxes? So, yeah, yeah. So um, I was, a, you know, collecting sales tax and, and a couple of neighborhood moms complained uh, that their kids were spending money on baseball cards and stickers bars and in, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, and so the the business department came and shut me down. So really? Yeah. Yeah. It was quite funny. The, I wasn't home. They came while I was at school and knocked on the door and, and they said, you know, your, your son's running an illegal business. We haven't had the heart to come over for about six months and tell you to shut it down. And, uh, but finally, uh, they decided to, and, um, so, but you know, it allowed me to get a, a lot of learning over about a year of how to operate a business and, and, you know, keep books and things that, you know, I use today, I, I'm, I'm a tech guy, but I actually really like the financial side of the business. And that, that stems from, you know, 35 years ago when I was running this little candy store. Yeah. That's an interesting story. There's no way, no way you would know this, but I did something similar when I was in high school and bought from smart and final, except uh, I went to Rancho high school, which you know of. Mm -hmm. And it's hot as heck in Vegas. So I didn't do candy bars. Me and a buddy of mine, we did now and laters. And we stuck to now and laters because they wouldn't melt. And we melt, were selling yeah. them out of the high school locker. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe that's why we didn't get caught by the business department. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, better. Note better to better self, that. do it at school. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's a great story. I, uh, I, I was laughing. I, you know, anybody watching on YouTube, they saw me dip my head and sort of 
hand clap without saying anything because it just rang true. I was like, ah, yeah, smart and final. Uh, that was our day. That was our Costco of the day, y'all. For for uh, for those who don't know, Smart and Final, you missed out. They're still they're still around, but I think they focus on like restaurants and things like that now. You can still yeah. hear. Um, I see them in other cities, but they're still here in Vegas. There's one right around the corner from me. Uh, yeah, yeah, but they're very cool. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's uh, just trying to you know you see kids doing lemonade stands and trying to figure out how to make some money to do what they want to do, and I you know uh, encourage that. Because uh, you know, that that spirit of figuring out a way to get what you want is really important in this country, and uh, just should start from a young age. That's right. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. So you landed in the world of technology, cybersecurity, Wi-Fi, networking. Let's spend some time there. Your company is Stimulus Technologies, and you've had it now since. 1995. Come on, dude. Long time. You, you're almost 30 years in that one company. Talk to me about how you got to the world of technology and what was what's, what was the intrigue then and what keeps you so passionate about it now? We got some some cool stuff to talk about later, but let's talk about that story. Well, that even goes back further than my candy store. So I, uh, I've always loved technology. Uh, we got a little Atari 800 XL when I was four or five years old. And my brother is seven years older than me, and he was taking some classes in middle school and high school for electrical engineering. Um, and so he would spend a lot of time on this computer that you would have to program. I mean, it was nothing like today. I mean, you turn it on, and the only thing that would come up on this computer is a little prompt, and you had to literally start programming to get it to work. Uh, to do anything for you. And we'd get these magazines in uh, every month and it would have like games that you could sit there and program and sit there and type in these games and, and write these programs. And, um, you know, my brother and I just learned to do this. And it was it was pretty amazing to, uh, to find, you know, a, a, a new thing that you could like invent stuff and, and write stuff and actually would do things. And it was so much fun. Um, and we did that for many years. Uh, I, you know, like love technology. I learned about a lot about it in school. Took computer classes. Um, eventually, uh, went to UNLV, and uh, super tragedy that happened uh, this week at UNLV with uh, some shooting. And I'm you know, sad to sad to uh, that that happened in a place that I love. Um, yes, but went to school there for uh, for computer science and just just love everything about technology. And he because it allows you to do things um, that would be difficult or next to impossible to do without technology. You know, I think about, uh, you know, 60 years ago when they were trying to send, you know, men into space and there was, you know, thousands of engineers were sitting there with pencil and paper and calculating this, all this stuff. And, you know, one computer or one guy can do the same work that hundreds of men and women were required to do previously. And, um, you know, we're just so much more productive and efficient today because of technology. And and it's fun to work with too. I mean, there's so many different aspects, you know, it's gaming and entertainment and podcasting and video. And there's just so much that, that technology allows us to do. And it's brought the world closer together. You know, yeah, I can communicate with people that I know all across the world and and it's all because of technology. Yeah, you're right. And uh, I'll uh, echo your sentiment to UNLV. I spent a, quite a bit of time in Beam Hall uh, during my time. And uh, yeah, just a very unfortunate tragedy. There's no student and or faculty member that should ever have to uh, go through what happened there. And uh, so I, I agree with you that. It is interesting. The uh, Talk to us about your today world of technology, because your company uh, spans across a number of uh, arenas. So share with us a little bit of those those uh, those categories of service that you guys provide to your to your client base. Sure. So you know, really, and and that's a good point. We we do a lot of different things at Stimulus Technologies, and one of the things that I've learned over almost thirty years of doing business is, you know, our customers want 
one company, one trusted advisor, one one company to contact for all their technology needs. And so it's led us to expand our offering. Um, when we started the business, it was my brother and I that started in his garage in 1995. And we were just building computers, um, doing work for friends and family. Uh, it was a side hobby for us while we were going to school. Uh, but we realized that there was, you know, a demand a high demand for support and help as small businesses were trying to use technology inside their companies. And, you know, the internet was up and coming um, and realized that, you know, if we could merge, you know, computer support with internet services and software development and eventually voice over IP um, and phone service, you know, it was one complete solution for our clients. And, that's what's brought us into these different things. So it's evolved a lot over the last 30 years. We do a comprehensive, um, we call it managed IT services, which is basically, you know, taking our um, our clients complete look at where they are at with technology, both their computers, their servers, their network, um, help desk support, software, all that, and look at it from a you know, complete holistic perspective and try to, you know, solve the problems that companies are facing in their businesses with technology and, and support that. And then adding on, we are an internet service provider. So we run our own network and compete against, you know, the big providers that are out there, but mostly focusing in areas where there isn't service, isn't fiber or cable service um, and deploy it through fixed wireless, um, which is an alternative solution to get out to these hard to reach places. Uh, voice over IP was added on about 20 years ago that we provide phone service to clients. Um, and now it's that's expanded and changed a lot as people have gotten mobile. Um, and then finally, the biggest thing that's the trend that's happened in the last 10 years is you know, hacking has really gotten um, into small business. And, you know, hackers used to go after these big companies, but now it's really uh, most of the hacks are happening against small businesses. And so we as a company have to do a lot more today than we did five years ago to help small businesses protect themselves against all these cyber threats that are out there. And so those, those uh, four different areas are really where we focus at in our company now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine your hands have to be pretty full with the cybersecurity threats. And um, I know that uh, it's only going to get, what do you, let me ask this question. How do you see AI impacting the speed at which perhaps cybersecurity becomes even more a risk um, for all of the neat things about it and being able to chat and get information and avoid Google and get things at your fingertips? Doesn't this empower that that uh that dark side of the web even even more what's your thoughts there it does um you know there's a lot of different ways that ai can be used in cybersecurity, and they're they're just trying to you know i'm sure the hackers are evolving it as we're talking um you know just from simple perspective i mean i'm sure you guys have heard of chat gpt and and um you know the power that it is to take natural language and improve it so you know you guys I'm sure everybody that's listening has gotten that email from a hacker that tells you to go do something, you know, buy your Amazon gift cards or, um, you know, log into your bank account that's not really your bank account, things like that. But the hackers, you know, they're just, they don't, they haven't written them well in the past. It's, it's been relatively easy for people uh, to be trained to spot these type of emails. But what, what ChatGPT has done is, um, you can scour things like LinkedIn or your other social media profiles or a company website and find out what's happening in the lives of the people that are working there. And let's say, Daryl, you're working for a large corporation and you recently got a promotion to be a senior vice president of engineering at this company. And you update your LinkedIn profile, maybe they update the website and suddenly like a hacker could detect that automatically using AI and then write an email to you saying, you know, for maybe another colleague, maybe somebody that you used to work with that because they have those links built in and they could spearfish you very accurately and say, Hey, congratulations, Daryl, on your promotion to, 
um, you know, senior VP, we worked together for a long time and I wanted to just send you like a $10 gift card to Amazon to, as a congratulations, you know, um, it's attached, click on this link and, and it looks legit. I mean, it's somebody that you, you knew it's talking about something that just recently happened and, you know, it just looks a hundred percent legit and it's written in a language generated by these AI systems. That's a hundred percent natural. And so how would you detect that? I mean, it looks hundred percent legitimate. Yeah. Uh, and then you click on that link. It asks you for your Amazon password to associate that gift card with your Amazon account. And suddenly they're, they're right into your Amazon account. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's the, just uh, gotten crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think the best defense that I've had, because obviously I'm a business owner as you are, I'm sure you get as many of those incoming messages as well. One of the things, of course, I've been privileged to sit through, if not two or three or four of your cybersecurity talks. So uh, I've taken lessons from each of your talks, but uh, one of them that I, I has served me well, and certainly give me your thoughts on it. And that is, by the way, the scenario you painted is 100% real. The messenger, messages are getting harder and harder to detect. I hover over the sender's name and look at the underlying email address that it's coming from to see if that makes sense. And I know that takes some extra work, but generally speaking, like I'm on the Google Workplace uh, Gmail and I can see the email right underneath the sender's name. And we get them all the time, Nathan, from Facebook, supposedly, Amazon, supposedly, Bank of America, supposedly. And that's been my little safeguard to try to avoid the extra links. And then the other one, Nathan, is this one. And I know they'll fix this too. But usually in the bottom of the email, when they have the quote unquote unsubscribe and all of the corporate information, they usually misspell something. And that'll probably change as obviously AI knows how to correct that stuff, but it is definitely becoming a massive uh, challenge. Let me flip the question around. Mm -hmm. Where does AI fit into the, uh, the positive side of your business, if at all? Uh, does it, does it, is it integrative into any of your suite as of yet, or do you see it in the near future being integrated? We're certainly using it on the marketing front, um, to generate ideas and concepts for some of the marketing that we're doing. Um, you know, we're, and so that's one side of it, uh, on the creative side, um, you know, we're not using it to generate, um, uh, content but you know just like an idea like um we call it rubber ducking where we you know just bounce ideas off of off of these ai systems mm -hmm. the other thing that really is on on the security side you almost have to use ai to detect ai so mm -hmm. you know one of the things you can do with chat gpt is if you take and put in there and say hey can you tell me if this was generated by ai and it will give you like a score and say well yeah most likely i generated it Chat GPT would tell you that, or it appears to be AI generated. Um, and so the AI systems can do almost a better job at detecting AI generated information wow. than a human can. And so what a lot of these security tools that are out there um, are using AI to detect threats um, much faster, much more effective than, you know, just general programmed algorithms that we've used in the past. So security systems are getting smarter because AI is in use to detect those threats that are out there. Uh, the other thing that we see um, in business and, and we are investigating and haven't implemented it yet, but really just, you know, the, the chat systems allow for automated um, discussions with clients or routing of tickets. We, you know, we get a lot of service requests from customers, you know, better routing to the right person that can solve the problem. Um, and, you know, quicker solutions like from a help desk or, you know, frequently asked question thing, you know, better, better information that, you know, provides self-service for our clients or faster routing to the right person to solve their problem. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're investigating is, you know, better ways to do that in the future. Um, and that's stuff that's, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. You don't have to invent it from scratch. You don't have to hire data scientists and, you know, high-end programmers. There's, there's a lot of tools that um, are out there that are really neat that, um, you know, that you can integrate with existing systems. Yeah. Yeah. So 30, five, 30 years, almost it's stimulus more than that 
as an entrepreneur altogether, those listening to this show should resonate with the idea that entrepreneurship, it's a, it's a, it's a journey, it's ups, it's downs, it's roller coasters. Uh, you and I sit in a private, uh, executive group and, uh, we have ups and downs over the 30 years. I want to get into your personal life of how you take, take care of yourself in the journey of life and business as an entrepreneur now 30 plus years in, if you, if you count your 11 year old, uh, you know, journey of, uh, <laughs> you know, illegal criminal of behavior, Nathan, shame on you. I didn't know that about you. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's a tax do do? evader at 11 years old, you know? <laughs> yeah. How do you take care of your mind? How do you take care of your body? I, I know some of that, but I think our, 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 um, our audience would be intrigued to hear this part. So, you know, as a tech guy, um, I sit in front of my computer all day long and about 15, yeah, I guess 12 years ago, um, I had some people that were close to me, uh, that passed away. Uh, they were quite a bit older than me, uh, but passed away younger than they should have. Um, family members that much younger than they should have that uh, were ill for different reasons. And I was overweight, uh, highly stressed out, um, working many hours. You know, a lot of times I, you know, I was putting 12 to 14 plus hours in. Um, Plus, I have five kids and, you know, working all day, you know, taking care of the kids, nights and weekends. I volunteer for different organizations. Um, I was, you know, overweight, unhealthy, and probably ending up down a road that I would, you know, I couldn't imagine living a full life to, you know, 80 plus years old. And I just had this realization in my early 30s that I had to do something about it. I needed to change my life and focus at least a portion of my day on making sure I was okay. Part of that was mental, um, taking time out to focus mentally on myself. Um, that includes doing some one-to-ones uh, throughout the month, um, taking time to meditate and to, you know, just work on mental health. Um, and then the other part of it is physical. So I lost a lot of weight, um, focused on, you know, body strength and, and health. And then I had a friend of mine that encouraged me to get into triathlons. And, you know, if somebody said, oh, go do a triathlon, you know, 15 years ago, I would have said, that's crazy. There's no way I could do all of that stuff. Um, I can't run a mile without dying. You know, let alone speed walk a mile. Uh, but he said, you know, just try it out. Let's let's do some stuff. And and uh, I had already enjoyed doing all three disciplines. You know, I, I when I was a kid, I enjoyed swimming. I've always enjoyed bike riding. Um, I wasn't a runner, but I did enjoy getting outside. And I had a dog. Um, and we would, you know, I'd go on runs. I'd go, you know, started biking a little bit more. Um, joined a gym, swam, and. Within about a year, I did my first Olympic triathlon um, at the end of 2012. Um, Olympic is is kind of a the larger the small distances, so it's a 1500 meter swim followed by about a 26 mile bike ride and a 10k at the end, and it felt amazing. I mean, to complete that, it was it was absolutely amazing. Um, I started running more, did my first half marathon about the same time, uh, continued on doing more triathlons, um, upgraded to marathons, uh, eventually did uh, a half Ironman. And then a couple of years ago, I did my first full Ironman, which is a, a 2.4 mile swim, followed by a 112 mile bike ride and a, and a marathon at the end, 26.2 miles. And uh, it's my a God. long day. <laughs> it is. <laughs> It's a little insane. Let's just put it that way. It's uh, it's crazy. It's because more than it's, insane, but damn, you got it done. <laughs> yeah, and and it's not it's not about the the day of. It's it's the you know hundreds of hours before it Prior. that mm. go into a successful day. Say that, but say that. Yeah, and and for me though, that time and I usually work out early in the morning. Um, that you know, four thirty, five o'clock in the morning for an hour to two hours that I, I'll do the work um, is a time for me to focus on, um, I, I know running and meditating usually don't go into 
uh, the same same sentence at the same time. But that's really my time to really think and focus and clear my mind and to do something for myself. Um, and it's just a strong start of a day. So I work out and I do something for training uh, six days a week and I and I rest on Sunday, uh, the Lord's Day. So that's, you know, that's really given me the ability to um, give full energy to my business and my family throughout the day and hopefully be here uh, much longer than I would have alternatively. I uh, love the, uh, the, I didn't even know all of those components, although I've kind of been at a distance watching some of these things. Um, again, congratulations on the awareness in your early thirties. Um, we, we chase our dreams in this business thing. And we, before we know it, we're just committed to the end. We're committed to the result. We're committed to our customers, our employees, the, the process of the business and the industry. And somehow, sometimes we get lost. And so I'm glad that, uh, you articulated it the way you did, because you're like every day, six days a week, I give myself some time mentally as well as physically. And it's very interesting. You said what you said, because I do find that in my workouts, I kind of, I, I feel that they are a form of meditation for me because I am disconnected. I'm not thinking about a client search engine. I'm not thinking about that stuff. I'm not thinking about Google ads. I'm not thinking about those things. So I'm glad you shared that. Do me a favor though. You left something off. Uh, tell the audience this uh, hairy, audacious, big, big, hairy, audacious goal that you set for yourself and tell us where you are with it. So a current goal, which I always have random goals with, with our, my exercise, um, but my current goal is to do a marathon in all 50 states under four hours each and uh, before I'm before I turn 51, so in my 50th year, um, it might be a challenge to meet the time frame. It's it's uh, ticking away quick, <laughs> but uh, but that's my goal. So I'll, I'm uh, six states in, sub four hours, uh, 11 states total that I've done marathons in. So you know, part of the problem with this goal is a sub four hour marathon. Doing that consistently means you have to be performing well. A, a four hour marathon is a performance. It is, it is, you know, the guys that are winning the marathons are doing it in two hours, but the average marathon time is about uh, four and a half hours mm -hmm. or so. And so I have to be above average by a decent amount each yeah. marathon, and each day is difficult. I just you know. This year, um, I I missed it on two of them, uh, both times because of a, a slight injury. Um, I was able to complete the marathon, but I couldn't keep the pace up. And, mm. um, you know, just a little injury, not enough sleep, a sickness, whatever it may be, um, can, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm not a professional marathoner, that can send me over the edge. But, um, yeah, but I'm, I, I love doing it. I, I What's your per it? mile pace on your marathon? So it's right around nine minute miles. Nine so, minutes over that time yeah. period. That'll Got that'll it. put you under the four hours is nine minute miles. Gotcha. And I'm sure that'll vary based on undulation and weather and wind and temperature and all those things, how you're feeling. There's a lot that goes into that. Just the idea. I just started running, as you, pro you probably heard me say in the group three and a half or so years ago, and I can... I can get under 10 minutes, but I cannot get it to 26 miles. I actually, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm proud of where I'm at, uh, three and a half years in. So I thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's a huge, that's a huge deal. And I think there's so much people, I think, especially entrepreneurs, really anyone listening, if you're a leader listening, you're an entrepreneur listening, we often are pouring into other people, other businesses, other, other people's lives. And we just have to remember, as Nathan said, we got to pour, we got to fill up our cup. We got to refill our cup because it just, uh, that's the way it has to happen. Otherwise you burn yourself out. I Nathan, think yeah. just kind of expanding it along that too. I think, you know, it, it, we owe it to our employees, to our customers and to our families to be able to show up a hundred percent. And if we're not, you know, performing well, because we're not taking care of ourselves, we're, you know, we're, we're hurting them, hurting other people. And we think of it where, you know, we're sacrificing ourselves or sacrificing um, our own time or our own well-being for other people. But if we're not showing up well for other people or for our businesses, um, 
then then we're just hurting everybody. So I think that's yeah. that's really that's the mindset I've changed about myself, you know, what that time means. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's right. Some people think of it as oh, I don't want to be selfish. No, no, no. Being selfish is good because we serve. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got to be selfish to serve. I mean, we have to take care of ourselves if we're going to serve at the highest level. That's, it's a, it's, it's a truth. So I got two more things I really want to talk to you about. And I've watched and witnessed you take a different path, not an unknown path, but a different path to exponentially growing your business in the last several years. And um, why don't you share a little bit about your perspective and the journey by which you've taken uh, we don't have enough time probably to get into all the nitty gritties, but uh, share with everyone what you've done recently to, I think it's 4X or more your business, like by 400% top line. So it's it's probably a little bit more than that. It's uh, Got it. You know, and in a short period of time, like three years or something. It's It's been a ish. Yeah, ish. Um, so, you know, there's there, consistent organic growth is still a big part of our business. You know, we grow our existing base 10 to 15% a year is my goal. Uh, and that's what I can comfortably do. Um, but, you know, that that takes a lot of time to scale a business, especially when you're bootstrapped and, you know, you start uh, small. Um, and we, we actually, the way that it started was, um, uh, I guess about seven years ago now, uh, had a, a partner of ours that uh, I'd known for a long time that we did some joint venture work with, um, and he was looking to join a larger organization. Um, and I liked him as a person. It was just a sole entrepreneur. Um, he had a book of business. Um, and so we made a deal that uh, he came to work uh, for Stimulus. Um, we you know, brought his clients in um, and we acquired his company. Uh, and it and it was a great thing because we found a, a really good person that's on my leadership team of my company um, that wanted to be part of a bigger organization that had some clients to bring over. And it, and it was very creative to the company. Um, and so that was a, it was a small, small acquisition for us. Um, same year, we did a large, a little bit larger one. Um, that was a bit of a different story that the owner didn't come over. Uh, but again, it was a, we brought some great employees over, some great customers, and allowed us to grow at a faster pace. Um, we've done a total of seven acquisitions now um, in the last seven years, so about one a year. Um, we just completed our largest one up in Oregon um, uh, in August. And it just, you know, it's, it's a different way of growing. It costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of time, uh, but it is a way to, you know, exponentially grow the company. And, and what I like about it being an entrepreneur doing, doing the M&A versus, uh, you know, one of these large roll-ups or private equity group doing these is I can maintain um, what the founders of that company that I'm acquire, acquiring, you know, their vision of being, you know, a family business or a small business and really caring about the employees and the customers. It's not just about the bottom line for us. It's really about, you know, focusing on the, you know, their vision and growing, you know, continuing growing the company. So um, I, I love it because I, I, as I mentioned before, I like the financials. I like the process. I like that part of it. Um, and it's allowed me to, you know, use some things that I really enjoy about the business and, and, um, you know, learn about other people's businesses, the way that they've solved problems, incorporate those ideas into our company. And, you know, same thing, take things that we've done well and, and continue growing the, the other locations that we're expanding into through it. And on top of all of that, 30, 30 years running stimulus, your ultra marathoner, on top of all of that, you're buying companies and you managed to write a book here recently <laughs> called the CEO's Digital Survival Guide. Uh, who's that book for and what's the general thesis in the book? Yeah, I'm glad, glad you mentioned it, you know, because, you know, I don't have enough to do <laughs> each day. <laughs> so one of my other hobbies is I like backpacking. I That's love anything we, outdoors. Let me interrupt so. you real fast. That's what we say to him every month when he tells us his next escapade as if he has more stuff to do because he doesn't have enough things on his plate. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the, the great thing about being a business owner is you can choose, you know, the stuff you do on the outside too. Um, 
so I, you know, I was preparing for this, this backpacking adventure, which I had never done before in my life. And I relied on a lot of other people and a lot of books uh, to understand how to do this 210 mile trek that I was going to do across uh, the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And as I was, you know, on that journey um, and thinking about it, I, you know, I thought about, you know, there's a lot of business owners out there that don't understand technology or it's scary to, you know, when an IT guy or computer guy comes in and starts using random acronyms or talking about cybersecurity or all this stuff. And I, I just see it in their faces. It's the same face that I had when, when I'm trying to figure out how to do this backpacking adventure. And um, so I decided to write a trail guide for business owners and executives of how to understand technology inside their company and really change the culture of the company to be technology minded and also security minded. And it's a reference manual. It's it's designed to help entrepreneurs, um, you know, to take parts of their business and improve it through technology. And it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it. And, you know, there's some parts of it that you need a trail guide. You need somebody to help you through that process. Um, and there's parts of it that you can do on your own. And it depends on your expertise. I just went on a trip recently, um, to, to Finland and Norway and and I've never been there before and was doing stuff that I'd never done before and you know I had a I had a guide that walked me through it and it was it was a great adventure because I had somebody that was familiar with the area familiar with what to do and and it turned out great and that's that's the idea behind this book is you know there's it's a guide uh, but we as a company can provide additional resources um, to to go through this journey of technology and security and and hybrid workforces and remote work and and all the that business leaders are dealing with today so wow it's it's a fun journey and and hopefully it's an interesting book it's not just all tech talk it's it's uh, uh i try to relate it to other stories outside of um outside of technology to make it understandable right right yeah no and it took you a couple of years to get that if i remember when we talked about it so, uh, I, man, I appreciate every ounce of the journey, 30 plus years as an entrepreneur, taking a, a different approach, both organic, as well as the, the, the merging and acquisition of other companies, taking care of yourself. Um, you know, I think in highlighting this on, on the mind shift podcast, I mean, I think you've really articulated how this, we didn't get too much into some of the, the setbacks and when life knocked us down, but um, you've, you've clearly laid a, a foundation for probably how you navigate those things as well. You know, when life knocks us down, you've taken care of your body, you're taking care of your mind, and that probably helps get you through those tough times. And then when you have not enough on your plate, but your schedule's pretty full, <laughs> you've probably <laughs> figured out how to do that well. So Nathan, I appreciate you taking some time out, um, for the listing audience, where can they find you? connected with you. You're also doing some speaking, I understand. Where can people uh, connect with uh, Nathan Whitaker? So a couple of different places. You can visit the company website, which is stimulustech.com. I have a personal website, uh, nathanwhitaker.com. Um, watch the spelling. It's a little strange. So last name is W-H-I-T-T-A-C-R-E. And uh, so you can find me both those places. Uh, if you're interested in the book, it's available on Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble, all those places. And it's the CEO's Digital Survival Guide. Um, so I'd love to connect with you. You can find me also on LinkedIn and social media. Um, and we have our podcast too. So Daryl was on our podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. So Stimulus Tech Talk, um, you can find me there with uh, amazing guests like Daryl. I appreciate it, man. Look forward to it. Uh, yeah, appreciate being on your show. Uh, see you again next week. Yes, absolutely. I will see you next week. Uh, Nathan, thanks so much again for being here. Uh, listening thanks, audience, Darryl. I just thank you, uh, audience, for hanging out with us today. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with us. Hopefully you learned something uh, today through this conversation. A, if you're an entrepreneur or even if you're not an entrepreneur, encourage your kids at an early age to explore and to experiment and support that. Uh, I think Nathan, through his parents, they... They set a ground root foundation and gave him the pathway to do that. But you just don't make it 30 something years in entrepreneurship just because your parents gave you permission to do so at 11. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work, takes a lot of effort. Um, he highlighted a number of things about mental health and how he has to focus and be intentional on that. 
wants to pour into people and pour into his family and pour into his community and pour into his hobbies. But he had to step back and realize that he had to take care of himself. If you're in that situation, take that to heart. Take Do it now. Do it right now. Not later. Do it right now. Set aside some time and figure out what matters to you. What do you want? In his 30s, he said, I need to be, I need to be here longer. And he had a couple of negative situations that kind of caught his attention. But Nathan's a fantastic entrepreneur. I'm glad to call him a friend. And for those of you listening, I hope you hit the follow and subscribe button so that you never miss another episode. I'm your host, Daryl Evans, and I'll see you back on another episode of the Mind Shift Podcast. Take care. Hit the subscribe button so you can become a part of the Mind Shift community. We'll help you shift your mind so you can shift your results.